Today on America's Test Kitchen, Elle and Julia reveal the secrets to perfect falafel. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of canned chickpeas. And Becky makes Bridget a show-stopping Moroccan lentil and chickpea soup. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. My very first cooking job, which was about 25 years ago, was making falafel at a tiny vegan restaurant in Albany, New York called Dahlia's. Now back then, falafel wasn't as popular as it is today, which is good and bad. Good because falafel is delicious, it's healthy, and you can find it almost everywhere. But bad because there's a lot of terrible versions out there that no amount of sauce can fix. But today, Elle's gonna show us how to make falafel at home the right way. That's right, we tried a ton of recipes in the test kitchen, and the worst of them were dense, like hockey pucks, mm -hmm. they were dry and beanie and flavorless. But the best of them had nice brown, crisp exteriors, light, fluffy interiors, full of warm spices and herbs. Mm -hmm. Delicious. When they're good, they're good. Absolutely. So let's get started. First things first, chickpeas. Mm -hmm. This is our primary ingredient in falafel. And you want to stay away from the falafel kits that have ground dried chickpeas, they're terrible. We're soaking these because if you use cooked, you'd get hummus. Mm -hmm. If it were dried, you get flour. <laughs> exactly. Neither of which you want is something what we in want. the middle. Something in the middle. This is eight ounces of chickpeas. I'm covering these in two to three inches of cold water, and we're gonna soak them eight to twenty-four hours. So while these are soaking, we're gonna start with our mm, favorite condiment. Yes. Tahini sauce. Mm -hmm. Tahini is made with toasted ground sesame mm -hmm. seeds until it's ground into a paste. Has a nice texture, as you That's can see. That's a beautiful see. tahini. Yeah, it is. And we're starting with just a third cup. Now, to make a light, refreshing sauce for our falafel, we're just gonna add a few delicious ingredients, like a third cup of Greek yogurt and a quarter cup of lemon juice. Just that simple. So I'm gonna mix these together. I can't have a falafel without a nice hmm. sauce. I actually usually double the sauce and I put it on everything for a good couple <laughs> days. I mean, it's just delicious. All right, so it's a little thick. You can add up to a quarter cup of water to thin it out. And obviously the amount of water you add will vary depending on the thickness of your tahini and the thickness of your Greek yogurt. Oh, that looks good and smooth. Yeah, and we didn't change the texture too much, but we definitely added some creaminess oh. to it. This is making me excited about having falafel. <laughs> me too. Sooner than later. All right, so I'm gonna add a couple of pinches of salt for flavor, season to taste. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> That's so good. Now I'm more excited than ever for falafel. So I'm just gonna cover this. You can store it in an airtight container in your fridge for up to four days. All right, so these chickpeas have soaked. Mm -hmm. They're bigger than they were. Absolutely, and the texture's changed. You can kind of dig your nail in, you can pop it open like that. So it's just softened. Just softened. It's gonna do a lot for the texture of our falafel. So let's move on over and let's get started making the falafel with half an onion. This is about half a cup. I've had lots of falafel with great texture, but no flavor. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to achieve both. We're gonna pack these falafel with tons of herbs and warm spices. Three quarter cups of cilantro, three quarter cups of parsley. Lots of fresh <laughs> herbs. Lots of fresh herbs, it's super important. I love it when the falafel have kind of a green look to it, because you know it's gonna have some flavor. That's right. Two cloves of garlic minced, one and a half teaspoons of coriander, one teaspoon of cumin, one teaspoon of salt, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Ooh, just a little kick. Just a little kick. All right, and so we're just going to create a paste out of this. I'm gonna blitz it for five seconds. All right, that looks great. Definitely more like a pesto. Nice. Yes. And now we can add the chickpeas. Oh, here you go. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna just pulse these Six times. Let's That's it. A, we'll see. Mm, not quite. Okay. It's, There's some big pieces still in there. Yeah, there's still big pieces in there. We want the chickpeas to look like steel cut oats. Oh, that's pretty big, actually. Yeah, it's pretty big. Not this big, but I'll blitz it six more times and see what we do. Oh, that looks great. Take a look at that. You don't have to grind it that fine. We already are going to add a binder to this, so we don't need to make a paste. Ah, so you can leave it kind of chunky. That's right. It will contribute to the airy, fluffy texture of the falafel. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So we're gonna make a flour-based binder. 
So we have a quarter cup of all-purpose flour and a third cup of water. I'm just gonna give that a good mix. And we're gonna actually cook this binder in the microwave. So you're gonna make a flour paste? Basically. Most falafels are made with a dry flour as a binder. That usually yields a dry, mm -hmm. dusty falafel. We don't want that. We're gonna use this cooked paste to bind our falafel without drying it out. Mm -hmm. And it'll brown nicely, which is key. All right, that's well mixed. It needs to go in the microwave for 40 seconds. So we're just gonna stir it every 10 seconds to check the texture. Right, make sure it doesn't get lumpy. That's right. All right, so this looks great. It cooked for 40 seconds, stirring every 10 seconds, and we know it's ready because it'll stand to a mound when dropped from the spatula. Mm -hmm. This is actually gonna add some moisture to our falafel, which never hurts. And we're gonna add two teaspoons of baking powder. This is gonna act as our leavener and give us light, fluffy falafel. We're gonna add this to our falafel mix. So just mixing it well. Oh, it really mixes right in there pretty easily. It really does. I wanna make sure it's all up and through here. It almost disappears. It's like you don't even know that it's there. All right, that looks great. Would you mind helping me roll out some falafels? No, I'd love to. So we're gonna use a number 30 scoop. Love these, make it so easy to get evenly sized portions so they cook at the same rate. We're just gonna go scoop here. Nice level scoop. And then just give it a little shape. And we're gonna get about 24 falafel. All right, now what shape are we going for today? Golf ball shape today. Oh, we're doing round ones. Yes. I've seen them shaped like pucks. Yep, but I like the round because you have more of that fluffy interior. The pucks, they get a little dry. So what's great about this falafel recipe is that you can actually form them and freeze them. Oh, so you can cook them off to order. Oh yeah. Look at these falafels. We did a good job. Your Dahlia skills paid off <laughs> today, girl. It kind of came back after a while. Get your groove back, I get it. Well, these look good. I think it's time to start frying it. Mm -hmm. We have two quarts of vegetable oil here and we've heated it to 325 degrees. It's very important to keep this oil at 325 degrees. So when we cook the first batch, the tint might drop. Right, because if the oil's too high, you'll get too much of a crust, and you'll have okay. sort of an empty inside. But if it's too low, it won't ever brown. That's right. So we're gonna fry this in batches. So we're gonna start with half. I like to lower them in with the spider. Just I the don't blame side. you. Keep your fingers away from the oil. Yeah, and they're just gonna go for about five minutes. We're looking for a deep golden brown. I like to give them a little stir as they're in there. They don't stick together. And they'll start floating to the top the closer they get to being done. Okay, so the second batch is done. Oh, those are lookers. Oh man. Let's make some sandwiches. Yes. Mmm. I love all the condiments you have out here. Thank you. I'm mm. the condiment queen. Are you? Yes. So you got pita. One? Okay. Now, do you put a little tahini down in the pita? I like to get a little moisture down deep in the pita. Uh, and a little bit of lettuce. Cucumbers. Lettuce. Yep. And the tomatoes and the cucumbers start to release their moisture with that sauce. Heaven. Now, how many of these in a sandwich? I think three is the safe number. Yeah, three looks good because it fills it up nicely. Last but not least, a little more sauce. Top it off. Oh, that is a beautiful looking sandwich. Mmm. That's falafel done right. I love the heat from the falafel and the coolness of the cucumbers and the tomatoes and that lettuce. It's really that balance that's just awesome. Take that, Dahlia. <laughs> so if you wanna make the ultimate falafel at home, start by soaking dried chickpeas in water overnight. Using the food processor, make a spiced onion cilantro parsley pesto. Then add the chickpeas and pulse until coarsely chopped. Make a cooked flour and water paste in the microwave and add it to the falafel along with a little baking powder before shaping them into balls. Fry them in batches and serve with a classic tahini sauce and pita along with fresh cucumbers and tomatoes. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a fabulous new recipe for falafel. Killer, Al. Thanks. I might have to move to the fork. I'm just, yeah, I'm just gonna take this falafel out of here. <laughs>Chickpeas were one of the original cultivated crops. In fact, researchers found in the Middle East a crop from 7,500 years ago. That's a long time, but Jack's here to talk about a much newer hybrid, the canned chickpea. You know, these are a little <laughs> fresher. I just have to start with a little ode to the chickpea. Mm -hmm. It's having a moment. What sure is. can't the chickpea do? It's everything to everyone. There's actually a shortage, some people are saying. Well, you know, we're not only using the chickpeas, we're now using the liquid in a lot of our soup recipes. We are using the liquid to make meringue for vegan baking. It's called aquafaba. So anyway, this is gonna be simple, I hope, 
These are plain, as you can see. This is basically from the can. We also made hummus. You can dig in. Great. Um, Where's the hummus? <laughs> there is no hummus. We also made pasta with chickpeas and pancetta and all these herbs and rosemary and garlic. And you didn't get any of that today. No, great, thanks. Um, so this is mostly a good news story. I'm switching to my fingers, I hope you don't mind. You can taste however you want to taste, Bridget. There's really only one mistake that a manufacturer can make, and that is to leave out the salt. I think I might have found it. <laughs> and we found even if you cook it in a recipe with a lot of salty ingredients, canned tomatoes, uh, chicken broth, mm -hmm. pancetta, the chickpea itself never tastes properly seasoned. It's the idea of, you know, if you cook pasta in a pot with no salt, mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do to make it taste good, uh, no matter how salty the sauce is. Same thing with the chickpea. So we had six brands, two of them had little or no sodium, and those were at the bottom of the rankings. Mm -hmm. They weren't awful, but they were just bland. Among the four brands that contained salt, there were differences in texture. Mm -hmm. Some were a little creamier, some were a little on the softer side, some might have been a little bit on the firm side. That's basically about how they were cooked. So the dried beans are soaked, they're put in the cans and they're pressure cooked. And based on the temperature or the length, they might get a little bit softer or a little firmer depending on how the manufacturer makes them. But they're pretty small differences. You've been sampling them one at a time. <laughs> uh, it's very elegant tasting, don't you think? Yes. What a great cocktail party, Jack. I really, really have a thrill party. Oh. Anything you're noticing among these four samples? Yes. <laughs> they're all chickpeas. And they're all chickpeas. They're all cold. <laughs> and they're all in a bowl. This one tastes like it has zero seasoning. It's also, for lack of a better word, very al dente. Okay. Really, really almost gritty. And that's actually gonna translate in the hummus test. So we found the ones sure. that were on the firm side or the gritty side made kind of gritty hummus. Mm -hmm. And the ones that were really soft made a thin hummus. Like it didn't have enough body to mm -hmm. stick to a pita chip. And so you, the creamy chickpeas not only taste better right from the can, like you're having them here, but also they make a better hummus. So there's one that you clearly weren't that wild about. Mm -hmm. The other three. That's gone. This one, it's not too bad. It's not very well seasoned, in my opinion. This one, I like the seasoning. I think this is my favorite. Okay, you wanna see what you picked? I'm so nervous. You chose the winner. Oh, good. You agree with the tasting panel? Goya, we thought it had the best texture, right amount of seasoning. It not only did well in this test, it did well in the hummus test, in the pasta test. It's our favorite chickpea. It's a great all-around chickpea. All right, I'm gonna go with the other side. Uh, so this is Eden. This is a brand that has no salt, has a little kombu, some mm -hmm. seaweed, but it does not do the same thing that salt does. And it's very bland. As I say, it continues to be bland when you cook with it. It actually, they feel undercooked as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, this one? Progresso, it was recommended, mm -hmm. it's fine. Mm -hmm. Some of the tasters thought it was a little on the soft side. Mm -hmm. It was sort of the least favorite among the ones we recommended. Okay, and this one was probably the runner-up? And the runner-up, the mm -hmm. pastine. And uh, you know, again, it's Seasoned a, well too. It's a nice choice. You know, you start cooking with the pastine versus the Goya and the differences are probably gonna get fairly small. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the texture of these and the seasoning. Just throw them in the fryer and be done. All right, you're one happy chickpea. I'm one happy chickpea, very good. Well, there you go. Next time you're making a hummus or say you just want to eat them right out of a glass bowl. The winner was Goya chickpeas, garbanzos, and they sell for 89 cents a can. It's a good day in the test kitchen because we are making harira. Now it's a Moroccan lentil soup and it's chock full of hearty ingredients. You've got beans, greens, tomatoes, and warm spices. But best of all, Becky is here and she's gonna show us a really easy weeknight version that we can make at home. That's right, and it calls for mostly staples that you probably already have on hand. That's great because I've seen some really complicated versions out there, so this is easy. It's easy, simple. So we can eat it more often. That's right. <laughs> So I have a third of a cup of extra virgin olive oil. Okay. I'm heating this up over medium high heat. And we're going to be doing a meatless version of Harira. Okay. Sometimes it has lamb or chicken or beef, but we're yes. gonna do no meat in this No one. meat, but still gonna be nice and hearty. Nice and hearty, and partly in thanks to this oil, a third of a cup, this is really the only fat in the recipe, so it's gonna give it a little bit of richness. Oh, perfect. See that's starting to shimmer already. That's right. So I have one onion diced up, we'll put this in and two ribs of celery. And we'll let this go for about seven minutes. We're looking for the veggies to turn translucent and just a little bit brown. All right, sounds good. Spend seven minutes. 
you can see the veggies starting to get a little bit soft and translucent. So you're not looking for a lot of brown color here? No, just a tiny bit. You can see just around the edges. Okay. But not a ton. So let's move on. Let's turn the heat first down to medium. All right. And I'm adding a tablespoon of fresh ginger. And a lot of recipes call for dried ginger, mm -hmm. but we really like the zing that you get from fresh. They are completely different animals. That is so true. <laughs> the powdered ginger really just tastes floral, but when you start adding fresh ginger, you get a little heat kick yeah. as well. Yeah, so good. Mm -hmm. And now I have five cloves of garlic minced up. So we'll just let that go for a minute. We just want to start to smell it. And I can smell it already, right? I can smell it. So it's starting to smell really good. It sure in is. a minute. Let's move on to our spices. Okay. Now, Herrera sometimes will have up to a dozen spices. Yes, <laughs> I've made those before. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. It is. So we paired it down to five essentials. Okay. That'll really give you a nice balanced flavor. All right. So let's start with two teaspoons of smoked paprika. That'll, of course, mm. add to that beautiful smokiness. Two teaspoons of coriander, and that has a nice citrusy taste to it. Sure does. And we're using a good amount of both of these. We found that when we didn't use enough, the soup sort of tastes more like minestrone and ah. less like Herrera. So it was the smoked paprika and the coriander that really turned it into the Herrera. Exactly. All Those right. were sort of the two signature spices that we're using. But there's more. Oh, oh yes. So a teaspoon of cumin. Okay. Also very warm, a little bit smoky. Half teaspoon of cinnamon. That's warm. Very. Lots of complexity here. Mm. And then for just a little bit of heat, an eighth of a teaspoon of pepper flakes. Okay. So let's let that go for another minute. And we're blooming the spices in the oil. That's going to take away some of their grittiness because we're using a pretty good amount here. It's true, but the oil is also going to help to release the oil-soluble compounds and really make a smaller amount of spices taste even bigger and more complex. Right. And you want to make sure you're using fresh spices oh. here because we're using so many. Mm -hmm. Spices will generally keep in a cool, dark place for about a year. If it doesn't smell really potent, mm -hmm. then it's probably time to replace it. Time to let it go. Yep. All right, that's looking great. So let's add some fresh herbs. All right. We're going to be adding herbs in two stages. We're going to add some now and some at the end because this recipe has a lot of herb presence. All so right. Let's do a half a cup of minced cilantro and a quarter cup of minced parsley. Cilantro is just a continuation of that coriander flavor, right? That's right, both from the same plant. Yeah. Coriander is the seed and the cilantro is the leaves. All right, so it's been another minute, and now let's get some liquid in the soup. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be using four cups of chicken broth and four cups of water. We found that if we used all chicken broth, it just tasted too chickeny. Right. And we don't want that. And if you want to make this completely vegetarian, it's fine to use the full eight cups of veggie broth. And now we'll add the beans that we were talking about. I have one can of chickpeas, 15 ounce can, that's been drained and rinsed. We considered dried chickpeas for this recipe. They just take way too long to cook. Right. I've seen chickpeas, dried chickpeas. I've also seen fava beans used. Mm -hmm. Both of them can be a little bit of a pain. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to start from scratch. Yeah. So the canned chickpeas, perfect. Yeah, and you're really not sacrificing anything by no. using the canned. They're no. very good. They're yep. a great product. So finally, I'm adding one cup of brown lentils. These have been rinsed. I picked through them to remove any debris that was in there, and we'll put those in. Did you find anything good? <laughs> nothing good. Nothing <laughs> worth making jewelry out of or anything. <laughs> And you know, you can find canned lentils. I don't know if you've ever seen those. But I have never seen canned lentils. Yeah, they're actually a decent product, and we considered them here, but the dried lentils only take 20 minutes, so right. I'm just going to go with those. They're less expensive. But you wouldn't want to use something like red lentils because they would probably fall apart. They would. They would totally lose their shape. So I'm going to turn up the heat here to medium high. We're going to bring this up to a simmer. Once this reaches a simmer, I'm going to partially cover it, turn it back down to medium low, and let it simmer for 20 minutes. So it's been 20 minutes. And you can see this is the partially covered pot. We just have a little bit of space for some steam to escape. Mm. So that's looking good. And our lentils are just tender here. You can see they held their shape. That's just what we want. So let's move on. Let's add one 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes. And we're choosing that because it's already broken down, right? No work to do. Yep. I told you it was going to be easy. I love that Becky's keeping it easy here. And let's add a half a cup of orzo, okay. which is a pasta. Herrera typically contains some kind of pasta mm -hmm. or rice. There's a lot of different choices. We just liked orzo. So let's put that in. So I'm going to partially cover this again. We'll let it simmer for seven minutes, and then we'll come back and finish up. OK, it's been seven minutes. Let's take a peek here. Mm. Smelling so good. It does. So let's add some greens. Herrera almost always contains yes. some type of green. We chose just one that okay. we really like. This is four ounces of Swiss chard. I took out the stems and chopped the leaves into half inch pieces. All right, not using the tough stems. No, we can use those for something else. They're totally edible, but mm -hmm. just not in the soup. So four ounces. There's some pretty color there. Yeah, really nice. <laughs> so we'll stir that up and we'll let this go for another five minutes. Okay. Also partially covered. All right, so it's been five minutes. 
And let's take a look. It smells crazy good in here. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna take a quick taste. I wanna make sure that pasta is done. Okay. I'm also gonna check for seasoning. Really good, <laughs> if I do say so. <laughs> and you should. Turn off the heat here. Okay. And we're going to finish the soup with two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. Just brighten it up. Yeah, and lemon is a very predominant flavor. Sometimes it even includes preserved lemons. Mm -hmm. But we, we really like the bright taste of the fresh. We're also gonna add some more herbs. Okay. I'm gonna add another quarter cup of minced parsley and another quarter cup of minced cilantro. Again, just to add some freshness at the end here. The herbs that you use when you put them near the beginning of cooking, they're gonna give a very different flavor than herbs added right at the end. Absolutely. So allow me here. So colorful. It's gorgeous. Isn't it? You can actually smell the cinnamon and the cumin, mm. the smoked paprika as well. I love smoked paprika. It's like the bacon of the spice world. Yes, it really does have a really <laughs> nice smokiness to it. So I have a couple of garnishes here. Some fresh lemon, of course. I recommend giving it a little squeeze there. And yeah. then this is harissa. This is a North African chili paste. Mm. It's got a lot of spice to it, great depth of flavor, and it really adds a lot of complexity to the soup. It sure does. You can find this in the international aisle of most supermarkets. We also have a recipe for harissa on our website. Ah, very good. So you're never without it. That's right. <laughs> you don't want to be without it <laughs> after tasting this soup. Right? The lemon, the herbs. Everything. Oh, yeah. Warm. Mm -hmm. The beans, the, the chickpeas and the lentils, they're both creamy and tender. You get that little bits of orzo in there too. And the, you know, they don't take over, but it's a nice little counterpoint in texture. But yeah. I love the tomatoes and the lemons. Nice brightness. You have all those warm spices in there too. It's really rich and mm. satisfying, but it's, it's light at the same time. You know what I mean? You're not gonna get stuffed at the end of the meal, but no. you're gonna feel totally satisfied. Well, you can call it what you want, but I would call it outstanding. Thank you, Becky. You're welcome. Well, if you'd like to make Herrera at home, it starts by sauteing onions and celery and then load in the spices. You've got ginger, coriander, and smoked paprika, along with fresh cilantro and parsley. Simmer with broth, chickpeas, and lentils. Add tomatoes, orzo, and Swiss chard, and finish with lemon juice and some more fresh herbs. Serve with lemon and harissa. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a spiced, smoky, sultry harira, or Moroccan lentil and chickpea soup. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our testings, tastings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thank you, Becky. Sultry, right? Mm. <laughs> Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.